We'll get started soon. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce Gary Mishiris, who's the managing partner of Silver Ring Value Partners, an investment firm in a with a concentrated long-term value approach. Uh, he also teaches the value investing seminar at the F.W. Olin Graduate School of Business in Boston. Uh, before founding the firm in 2016, Gary was a managing director at Manulife Asset Management since 2011. Uh, where he was the lead portfolio manager of the U.S. focused value strategy. Earlier in his career, Gary worked as a research associate at Fidelity and a vice president at Evergreen Investments, which later became part of Wells Capital. And with that, oh, one more thing, sorry. Uh, Gary also holds degrees in computer science and economics from MIT. And uh, while we're doing the chat today, feel free to ask questions as they come up. I will uh, be moderating throughout the webinar. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Gary. Thank you, John. Really appreciate the introduction. And thank you, uh, everyone who is joining us today. I appreciate it. So uh, what I'm going to talk today about today is how to invest for the long term in a turbulent market. And we certainly have had a turbulent market recently with December and then the January rebound, but that doesn't matter because there have been many more wilder swings and likely there will be. And I think it's very important that we prepare and we have the right framework for how do we invest in that environment. So as uh, John mentioned a little bit about my background, I'm not going to repeat that. Um, if you, uh, you know, think about silver and value partners, the things that I'm aiming for is competence, alignment of interest and passion. You know, I really love what I do. And uh, I would be doing it uh, even if uh, there were no money involved. As Warren Buffett says, I do really tap dance to uh, work. Well, not really, you know, uh, in physical shape, but ter in terms of the excitement that I get out of doing what I do. Um, you know, everyone has needs to have a competitive advantage. And I think investing is difficult. And the four things that constitute my competitive advantage is the long-term time horizon, a limited asset base that allows uh, me to invest in the inefficient parts of the market, a microeconomic focus on company-specific situations. And I think most importantly, and we'll talk about this later today, is temperament, which is the ability to actually execute your strategy under duress. I, I won't uh, go in depth into investment philosophy, but suffice it to say is it's a concentrated intrinsic value approach to investing. So let's dive in. So I guess you know, this picture maybe says it all is, you know, if you look at that little money train, uh, everyone really feels good when, you know, they get validation from stock prices, right? You buy a stock and it goes up or you buy a mutual fund, it goes up and you feel smart, you feel good. And the question is, what happens when the, the bottom part of the roller coaster happens? Like, what do you do? How do you execute? Can you stay the course? Um, you know, and I know some very smart people who are analytically extremely uh, talented but they really fall apart. They don't have the process in place. They don't have the mental discipline to stick with the process and they don't make the right decisions right when it matters the most, even though you can make an argument that that's when it all counts. So that's what we'll talk about today. So first, let's kind of step back and say, why do you want to invest for the long term? You know, so you know, a lot of times people say, well, don't you make more money if you invest for the short term and isn't a long term a series of short terms or something like that and uh, you know I think there are four advantages the first one is it really allows you to take advantage of investment opportunities that others might shun you know I always like to say if you take your typical portfolio manager or investor out there and you say you're gonna get a really good three-year return on investment but the first two years are gonna be really bad but and then the older return is gonna come from the third year many are gonna pass and why? Well, it might be they just don't want to wait that long, but some of it could be structural. They might get fired. They might lose uh, their bonus or, or they might just, you know, meet with a disapproval of others or themselves if they wait that long and don't get that quick validation. I think being a long term investor, it helps guard against behavioral biases, which is the second point. I think that behavioral biases, as we talk about, is one of the biggest hurdles we as investors face. It's not easy to overcome them. And I don't think there's anything you can do to completely eliminate them, but we'll talk about some strategies. How do you guard against them? What can you do? The third point is that I think long-term investing reduces frictional costs. 
such as trading expenses and tax impact. And I run the math and it is amazing. You know, if you take the same pre-tax return, let's say 10% or whatever number you want to use, and you compare what that means in terms of after-tax returns, if you're a taxable investor, there could be a ginormous difference, and that's a technical term, by the way, um, about between what it might mean if it's all short-term profits versus if it's all deferred long-term compounded capital gains. So I think that that's very important to keep in mind. Not all pre-tax returns mean the same thing after tax. And then finally, there's evidence, and the article that I wrote on this topic uh, on the behavioral value investor site uh, shows the data is that the best uh, you know, performance is associated with long-term holding periods. Now, you know, there's no way to prove that's causality, right? So as far, you know, it is just correlation, but I do think there is a causal relationship there because I think those investors are taking advantage of more inefficiencies in the market uh, versus what I think someone who is a short-term trader can. So I guess I, I like this uh, quote. It's one of my favorite quotes because, you know, it's not enough to just have a plan. You know, I, I think Mike Tyson famously said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth, right? You know, great quote. And it's like, well, it's investing. No one is punching us. But I don't know if you've ever lost a lot of money or had at least on paper lost a lot of money. Sometimes it can feel very much like you're getting sucker punched. I can tell you a quick story from my first year when I was a young associate of Fidelity Invest uh, Investments, and I recommended a stock that we own 15% of the company, over 100 million. I was 21, uh, the young kid out of school, out of MIT. And I remember being very confident. I did all this analysis. I told all the portfolio managers, hey, you got to own the stock. Here are the reasons. Here's the valuation. It's a good value. And then right before Christmas, they one day they pre-announced earnings, they suspend their dividend, and the stock opened up down 50, and that's five zero percent I literally felt nauseous. It's just hard to describe that feeling. You can analytically think about all you want, but when you just, on paper, lost your firm $75 million, it does not feel good. So, you know, I think it's important to have a plan. It's important to prepare for that moment because we're all going to be wrong, at least some of the time. The best investors are going to be right, you know, a fraction of the time. Uh, and wrong a fraction of the time. So you got to prepare for what happens. How do you make the best decisions under duress? So I think there are three keys, and we'll talk about them in turn. The first is you got to have the right structure. If you don't have the right structure, it's just not going to work for you. Um, and I'll talk about what that means in a second. Second, you really need to have a written long-term investment process. I think that sometimes people say, well, I know what I'm doing. I've been doing this for a while. Why don't you write it down? You really do need to write it down, and I'll talk about why in a minute. And finally, as I mentioned, behavioral biases is a big kind of hurdle to overcome in investing. You re I think having a behavioral checklist and then having an active plan for how you're going to guard and defend against those biases, that's really important too. So you really want to make sure you have that in your arsenal. And we'll talk about all three of these things uh, later in the webinar. So what is the right, the right structure? What does that mean? So the main, the first thing that you absolutely cannot compromise on is never be a forced seller. So uh, being a forced seller is just tremendously problematic because it doesn't matter what your valuation work is. It doesn't matter what your analysis is. If you can't hold on for the right price for the long term in the security, it doesn't matter because you can be stopped out at a very disadvantageous price. And you can be right in theory, but in practice have a very poor result. So very important. Um, not to have a situation where you're a fourth seller. Second is you do want to create a systematic uh, system to guard against behavioral biases. We'll talk about that. And then third is you know, really want to avoid poor governance. Uh, and you might think, well, what are you talking about, Gary? Governance with what? You know, I'm an individual investor. There's always governance. It might be your wife. It might be you know, the rest of your family. Unless you're literally living in a mountain by yourself and have all your wealth just for yourself and no one else, there are usually other people, other stakeholders involved. So you really need to communicate, communicate, communicate. I can't stress it enough because you, they, these people, the other people who are involved really need to be on board with the process, know what you're going to do, and they need to be a help, not a hindrance when the going gets tough and you're, you know, maybe your process isn't working for a period of time. Uh, so, so never being a forced seller. So what does that mean? So I think the first, uh, you know, 
point is that you really you, know, you want to choose the price at which you sell inv uh, your investments. You don't want to be forced to choose, uh, sell at a disadvantageous price. And what can cause you to become a short seller, a uh, short seller, huh? poor seller, hopefully not a short seller. Uh, you know, first is lack of liquidity. So let's say you, you you decide you you need to buy a house, so you need to buy a car, or let's say you're an endowment and you have your five percent distribution that you want to give you know to your organization. You really want to make sure that you plan for that, and there are various ways to plan for that. One way might be if you're an individual, you might say, okay, I'm going to have a certain number of months of expenses in a cash reserve. Um, so. You know, that's one way if you you might have a bond letter where you have uh, bonds that are maturing at the same time and the same amount as the your expected expenses there are many ways to do it but the important thing is that you have a plan for meeting your the needs of the portfolio where you need to take money out so that the part of the portfolio that you're investing for the long term really can be you know invested for the long term next is financial leverage so i mean it's you know sometimes it's exciting right you know if you're doing great unlevered why not you know borrow whether it's on margin or in some other way right um well you know there there are nuances to leverage but the worst kind of leverage is recourse leverage meaning that you borrow something and if that doesn't work out they can take the rest of your portfolio away so in you know, a simplistic example let's say you buy a stock and you think whatever stock is great and you say well i'm going to borrow and i'm going to get even more of a great thing terrific well what happens let's say you're wrong but let's say you're right let's say you're right about it on a long-term basis, but let's say in the uh, in the short term the market disagrees with you, and the stock goes down fifty percent. Well, you might get a margin call, and if you don't have any cash, you might be forced to sell that that stock at a, that price and lock in that fifty percent loss. Even if three, four, five years down the road, you might be proven right. You just your time horizon gets reduced, and that's very disadvantageous to you. So I. You know, for instance, Silver Ring Value Partners, I purposefully structured the partnership so that there is no portfolio leverage. There's no margin borrowing. It's in the documents. You know, not that I would be tempted, but in case I decided to go crazy, I'm not allowed. You know, that's you know, it's off the table. And that's for that reason. The next, you know, the next thing is misalignment between you and your key stakeholders. Uh, and again, let's say you're a CIO of a you know, foundation and, you know, that could be a board. You know, let's say you allocated the, uh, the capital, you're happy with decisions, and, and the board comes and say, well, well, you know, you're underperforming this year, or you're underperforming the last two years, we, we're going to have to change things. Uh, you don't want that. You want them to know your plan. You know why, you know why it works. You don't want them to, when the going gets tough, second guess you. Because, by the way, most of the time, the board, you know, there are exceptions to that, but a lot of times the board might not be as knowledgeable about investing as a CAO who is managing it. Uh, sometimes that's not the case, but a lot of times, you know, people are on the board for various reasons. Maybe they donate a lot of money to the organization. Maybe, you know, social standing. Who knows? Um, and you don't want to have people who are not as informed about the investing process be essentially making decisions in lieu of the person who is best positioned to actually do it. Um, it let's say it's just you know it's, you're an individual investor, but it could be your wife, right? You know, uh, let's say you have this great value strategy, and you told you know, her honey, you know, or him, you know, as we heard, you know, things are going great. You know, I'm, value investing works. You know, I've done this wonderful allocation. Uh, and then all of a sudden the year comes and you have terrible results. You don't want your partner uh, to say, whoa, whoa, we got to stop this. You got to sell everything. We got to go do something different because you want, then essentially your time horizon shrunk again. And lastly, you know, it's poor temperament and emotional control. Um, you know, you... I think Buffett talks about this a lot is that you know you need to have sufficient IQ, a good process, and a good temperament. And temperament, I think, is hard to teach. You have to work on your own. I think some people have a very good starting point, others less so. So I think that's an important thing to keep in mind as you decide how you're gonna invest. But if you really can execute on what you know rationally you should do, and you freeze up or you get scared and you do the opposite, it's a problem. I'll I'll give you an example. I have a friend. Uh, you know, we went to MIT together. Really smart guy, and every time there's a market peak, he uh, calls me and says, "You know, Gary, you know, should I sell my bonds and buy more stocks?" And then every time there's a sell-off, a recession, he says, "Oh my God, what I'm going to do? My 401k is down. Should I sell all my remaining stocks and buy more bonds?" So he's smart. I think he knows rationally that that doesn't make sense, but at the same time, that's what his tendencies are. Let me pause for a second and just uh, see how John is doing with the questions. John, anything? We've got one question. 
All right, so uh, let me read the question uh, for those of you who are not in the, char uh, in the chat. Um, what was your approach to set up uh, your fund uh, structures and the environment that could benefit you as a value investor? I think that's that's an excellent question. Um, so I think when I was setting up my fund, uh, I was very fortunate that Seth Klarman of Baupo's group was kind enough to give me some advice. And one of the things that really stuck with me from my conversation with Seth is that he stressed how important it is to have the right limited partners, which in the fund structure, those are the investors in the, in the fund. They're the, called the LPs. And he kind of gave me the example how in the 1980s when Baupo's was just starting out, it was really you know, great to have investors who were kind of cyclical meaning that when Seth saw great opportunities, but the markets were scary, he uh, was able to have those LPs add capital, which is very different, by the way. Most LPs behave pro-cyclically, so they'll take money out when the going gets tough for various reasons, right? So, and he said that, well, look, that really augmented my competitive advantage because a value investor can talk all they want about having a long-term time horizon, but if their client base doesn't share the same time horizon, then they're not going to um, have, I mean, the value manager is not going to be able to actually have that horizon in practice. It doesn't matter what they want to do. They just they lose the capital right at the worst point. So I think one of, you know, it's kind of a process of mutual selection with your LPs, meaning that it's not from a position of ar arrogance of like, oh, I'm high and mighty. It's from a position of fit. And I purposefully try to select uh, for people who are long-term in ward and deed. And there are a number of ways of doing that. One is I don't market performance, good or bad. I, I wrote my owner's manual. I purposely said that really short or even three, four year performance is completely statistically irrelevant. And it's very cynical to market that. By the way, most people do. And the standard marketing process is wait for a good three year stretch and market it or a good year and market that. Well, what happens if you get LPs or investors who are coming in because of that short-term performance, guess what? When you have a bad period of short-term performance, which by the way will happen to every single person, unless the only person it didn't happen to was Bernie Madoff. And we know how he got there. Uh, you know, this every year he beat the S P it's completely smooth. Turned out that those weren't real numbers. So everyone who's doing it for real, they can have a bad stretch. And if you select the people who are coming in based on short-term statistically irrelevant performance, good chances are they're gonna come out for the same reason. Another way uh, was setting up a fair structure and alignment. And for me, that meant having a situation where, you know, basically the victory was defined clearly up front and there is a performance fee that's about fair hurdle and there's a clawback, which is unusual. I mean, so half of my performance fee is deferred for five years, which is a long period of time. You know, I remember my lawyers came to me and said, Gary, is there some potential uh, client that's forcing you to do the structure because this is very unusual. We've never seen these deferral clawback mechanisms. And they thought there was a kind of a negotiation thing. I said, no, I want to structure things in a way that's fair to both parties. So if I were on the other side of the table, I would think it's fair and that aligns with a long term. So I think a lot selecting the right LPs is part of the structure. Having um, the right incentives uh, is very important. And then finally, I think having a written process that you communicate, and I'll talk about that later, it's kind of like the story about Odysseus and tying yourself to the masts as you uh, pass the island where the sirens are singing their song, right, and attracting sailors to their doom. You want to commit yourself to a process that you strongly believe in, execute that, and then hold yourself accountable. And I'll talk about that later. So I'm going to keep going with the presentations, but keep the questions coming, and you know, John will give me a heads up as they build up. So. You know, I guess the second you know part is you want to guard against behavioral biases, and I think that's you know so there's three parts to that. One is you want to know what they are. We'll talk about that. Two is you really want to have a plan. Just knowing biases does nothing for you. I mean, it's better than knowing not knowing it. But let's we all know that we are overconfident. Well, except for me. I'm just kidding. Uh, we're all overconfident in some ways, in some domain, right? But knowing that in and of itself is not enough. So you have to have a plan for how you're going to minimize their impact. And I think a behavioral bias checklist is really a, a bare minimum. It's kind of before you make an investment decision, you really want to have a checklist going through the common biases. By the way, you know, when I teach my students, one of the things I stress is you really want to customize. So for instance, if you know that you're more prone to certain biases more than others, 
you want to guard against those more vigilantly. You don't want to kind of apply a one size fits all approach. You want to really do this in a way that fits your own strengths and weaknesses. And that's, I think, a key concept for any investing. So I think avoiding poor uh, governance is really important as well. I think that, you know, I, I talked about my owner's manual, which is essentially my long form investment process with all the details, nothing held ba back. It's not a marketing brochure. It's really what I've sent to all my LPs and potential LPs before they invest. And I think it's really important to explain what are you going to do? How are you going to invest capital? Um, there's definitely judgment involved. So you need to say it's not formulaic, but it, it basically creates rigor and a systematic approach. So you really want to explain how you're going to handle those high pressure situations. Now, let's say you have a bad year or let's say your investment goes down a lot. What are you going to do? What is your process? How do you handle common situations that you need to address? Then I think it's important to uh, decide who has uh, decision making authority and under what circumstances before a crisis. So, for instance, I have set up liquidity terms intentionally for the partnership. So, you know, my LPs can take out money for most classes once a year. There's another class that's a little bit longer than that. Uh, but I think as a, at the minimum, they have to commit for uh, once a year. What that means is it doesn't matter if I have a bad month or a bad quarter, they can't take their money out. And by the way, that selects for the kind of LPs I want. Because if you're an investor and you would consider taking money out because of a bad month or a bad quarter, you're not someone where you're not going to benefit from what I do and it's not going to be a mutual fit. So I think the make, me deciding, you know, but let's say you're again managing an endowment. You really want to have a, a discussion with the board about, like, let's say you have a bad year. Well, let's say a specific investment is doing poorly. Let's say you allocate it to a, a fund manager and they're underperforming. Who has the authority? Is it the board? Can the board second guess the CIO and step in? Is it the CIO? Like, at what point is there that does that switch happens when the board? You know, what has to happen uh, before the board takes over? Or again, if it's your spouse, you know, I guess at what point? You know, how often do you sit down and review performance? You know, uh, do you review performance at all? You know, how do you how do you communicate? And at what point can your spouse step in and say, "Oh, well, you know, you thought this was going to be a great way to invest for you, but it's not working." So, is it if it's every quarter, that's a problem because if you have a five-year time horizon and your spouse has a three-month time horizon, you got to make sure you just you may have a decision beforehand about who's really in charge and at what point that changes. And finally, I think you have to have the right metrics. And I remember, so when I was taking the investments class at Sloan, MIT's business school, Ken French of the Farman French uh, fame was my professor, and he derived on the board how long it takes to get a 90% confidence interval uh, on average mutual fund track record. And what that means is uh, you 90% confidence interval basically says, I'm 90% confident this is skill and not luck, right? Turns out it was over 10 years. It's 10, 11 years. Um, and yet, the mutual fund industry is extremely cynical, and they market short-term performance all the time. They market uh, morning star stars all the time. And there have been studies that have shown that there's no correlation between those stars and future performance whatsoever. Um, so they, they take data that they know is statistically insignificant, and they use it to convince people to give them money. And I think that... That's why one of the biggest travesties, by the way, of the mutual fund industry is that the average mutual fund investor underperforms the average mutual fund by several percent. That's, by the way, not on top of whatever underperformance the average mutual fund has versus it, the index or the market. So it's actually the investor underperforming the fund. You might say, well, how can that be? Well, it's because they're buying high and selling low. They're buying after a stretch of good performance and they're exiting after a stretch of poor performance. They're... They have reverse reverse timing essentially, so it's uh, it's it's terrible disservice to the clients to train them to act that way. And yet it happens because it's profitable for the industry, and so I think whoever your kind of you know stakeholders are, you have to decide. Well, at what point are we going to say, okay, this strategy is not working? Is it after a quarter? Is it after twenty years? Is it after five years? I'm not saying that there's one right number, but you need to decide amongst yourself. So that let's say you have a bad period but it's a shorter period than you decided is the key measurement period, you can say, well, look, we've talked about this. We covered this in advance. Let's keep going. Or, you know, let's say it's not working. Maybe, you know, you decide, hey, let's say 10 years or seven years is going to be the right measurement period. If it's not working after that, you have to be honest with yourself and with your stakeholders and change things. So I think developing a written investment process is really, really important. 
I think writing it down, first of all, it forces you to be rigorous with yourself. You might think you know things, but you know, I found this a lot of times when I mentor people or when I teach my a seminar. Um, when someone asks you, asks you a question and you find yourself that, oh yeah, I know the answer, and then you try to explain it, but you really can't, uh, at least not easily, that's a good sign that you don't know that material as well as you think you do. So writing it down is important. You know, it's a really key tool to communicate with your stakeholders um, because I think you should lay it out and if they have objections, let them have objections with respect to the process, not objections with respect to, you know, a short-term outcome. So let's say, because that gives you extra credibility when you say, well, wait a second, well, I sent you this process, you agreed to it, right? They say, right. Um, you liked it before, right? Right. Say, well, I'm following it, right? You agree with that? Yes. Well, then what's the problem? So it kind of brings the conversation back to long-term and process away from short-term sporadic outcomes. And then by the way, you actually should follow it 100% of the time. Like I've been in the business, this is my 18th year, and unfortunately I've seen kind of how the sausage is made. There's the PowerPoint slide deck that people market to clients or prospects, and then there's what actually happens. Like you really shouldn't have that dichotomy. You really should have one process and what you should do what you say and say what you do. And that's what I attempt to do. And uh, then, and this is crucial, you know, you re your communication with your partners over time really should be centered around how you're executing the process, explaining what you're doing. Because sometimes I read a lot of letters from friends who are running funds, and there are many kinds of letters. There's the one pager that just focuses on performance. And I always tell my friends, well, what are you trying to accomplish here? Are you trying to train your clients to focus on short-term or relevant periods of time? I mean, my favorite, by the way, and I know some of my friends will get upset with me for this, but is the monthly up performance update. You know, especially from long-term value investors. So they're, they're, I have some friends who are good long-term value investors, and then they send these one-page performance updates. And I ask them, really? You're telling people to focus on five years, and then you're telling them about how your month went? Like, what possible relevance could it have? Um, and it's just it's just marketing, right? You know, it's, it's it nothing to do with investing. So you really should, your communication should explain how you're executing the process. So someone on the outside really should be able to audit how are you, are you doing what you said you're going to do? And by the way, you should not everyone should have the same level of sophistication as you. Like, for instance, your spouse might be less knowledgeable about investing uh, than you are, or your board members might be less, uh, less uh, sophisticated about the details of the investment process. But they should still be able to see whether or not you're doing what you said you're going to do. Let me pause here to see if there are any questions. Let's see. Uh, we have a question here. Get returns in value investing a lumpy. What's a good way to think about generating income for monthly living expenses while managing for the long-term portfolio? So I think there are a couple of ways. One is, you know, separate your portfolio into, you know, a long-term uh, piece and a, and a shorter, uh, and then uh, and then stuff that you're going to use to you know, live off of. For instance, you can create a portion of your portfolio that you're going to uh, create a bond letter out of. A bond letter simply means that you... Let's say you need 100000 a year for your expenses. Uh, so, uh, and let's say you need that every year. So you might have you know, zero coupon bonds from the government that mature in different years. So let's say uh, the first bond for $100,000 matures in one year, the second matures in two years, and the third matures in three years, and so forth. And three to five years is a good amount, I think. Um, and then the rest is long term. The rest is invested for the very long term. Now, you know that the next three years or five years, depending on how long the bond letter is, you're taken care of. You're fine. Uh, so you don't need to worry. Now, you have to manage that a little bit. A year passes. So you take out, um, you know, you get the 100000 from the bond. Again, you haven't touched your invest long term investments at all unless you want to. And then you have a choice. Do you reestablish re -establish another rung on that letter? So you buy you know, another $100,000 zero coupon bond for a, an ouch year or not. And I think there you have some flexibility. So if you have a five years initially, you could let that bond letter go down to three or four years and still have plenty of, you know, flexibility. If, for instance, the prices currently for your long-term investments are really disadvantageous. On the other hand, if you think the current price, you know, if you have more cash and you know what to do with on your long-term investments, this might be a good time to establish another run. So that's one approach. Um, you know, I think the, you know, I think having investments that have limited correlation helps. 
So let's say you didn't do that. And let's say you basically said, okay, I'm going to be fully invested in long-term investments and I'm going to just sell 5% of my investments or whatever that number is, four, five, six percent uh, and use that to live on. Well, I think the challenge with that is going to be if your whole long-term portfolio is down at the same time, there are going to be points in time where you're locking in really bad prices, bad from a perspective of they're undervalued uh, securities that you'd rather not sell. So if you have different parts of the portfolio that are acting differently and you can accomplish that without giving up too much expected return, that's something that you should consider. So let me keep going. And again, keep the questions coming and uh, I'll try to address them. And there will be plenty of time in the end as well. So, so I guess what does an investment process look like? And let's uh, you know, let's talk about that. Like, what is uh, what do you need? What are the elements? And I think the elements are the first. You need to really explain to yourself and to others why do you believe that the opportunities exist that you're going to be taking advantage of, uh, and also what is your competitive advantage? Uh, take advantage of those opportunities. So I talked earlier in the beginning kind of what I think my competitive advantage is. And by the way, it's not one thing. You know, I remember when I was starting my fund, a friend of mine who's an entrepreneur said, Gary, wouldn't it be great if you had the satellite that looked into the factories, parking lots, and could see how much activity there was for different companies uh, to measure their demand, you know, how they're doing right now, the business trends. And I said, well, it sounds interesting. Well, A, I don't have the satellite. And B, I'm not sure what I would do with the data. That, because I'm not trying to, I'm not a momentum investor where I'm trying to figure out which business has, is having a good quarter. I'm a value investor who's trying to figure out what is this business worth you know, in terms of a range of reasonable values based on the, you know, what I, my view on the industry and the company and a whole host of other factors. So I'm not sure how to use that satellite. Another thing is I think you can have a competitive advantage that's not one thing, but a combination of things, which I think is the case with me. And together they complement each other and you end up with a very potent advantage overall, even if no one aspect of it is that you know unique or powerful in and of itself. And again, you have to have a theory to why, you know, so for instance, one common reason that you know value investments are mispriced uh, are is time horizon arbitrage, right? Again, going back to the point is people want instant gratification. The average holding period in New York Stock Exchange of a stock is under a year. And if you can look at three to four or five years, you can uh, make an investment that others would probably agree is a good long-term investment. They just don't want to wait. Another, you know, you know, you might try to fish in, you know, inefficient parts of the market where there is either forced selling, which is always good. You never want to be a forced seller, but you certainly would love. It would be great if you wanted to buy from a forced seller. You know, there's no rule against that, or, or neglect. You know, uh, and I, th I think having you know small amounts. Uh, you know, that's one advantage a small investor has is that they can invest where a ten billion dollar fund really can't. So Warren Buffett is the world's best investor. I don't think that's controversial, but Warren Buffett's returns over the last 15 years of Berkshire have not been amazing. They've been slightly better in the market, not by a lot, less than 1% the last time I looked. How come? Did he lose his touch? I don't think so, not at all. I think he's better than he's ever been. I think what's happened is he's just managing so much money that he can invest it nearly the same rates uh, as uh, he would if he were managing a fraction of it. And he says the same thing, so this is not, me throwing shade in Warren Buffett. This is something that he admits and he knows it's just what laws of large numbers. So then you want to have a theory. The second point is how do you generate investment opportunities? Uh, you know, where, you know, what's your process for that? How do you do it systematically? So it's not just random, you know, uh, you know, maybe you find something we don't. How do you do it in a repeatable way? The next step, number three, is how do you value an individual investment opportunity? So let's say you are you know, your, your idea generation uh, process said, look at this investment. What do you do? What are your steps? How do you do it systematically? Uh, by the way, systematically, again, does not mean formulaically. There's still judgment involved. Investing is still both an art and a science. But you definitely want to have a system and a process that's repeatable. And that's, by the way, uh, that's customized to your own strengths and weaknesses. I can't stress this enough. There are people running around saying, well, I'm just going to imitate. You know, we already know who the best investors are. I'm going to copy Warren Buffett. No, I don't think that's the best way to go. How come? Well, they're not Warren Buffett. They don't have their circumstances uh, aligned with Warren Buffett's. They are not the same person. Their strengths and weaknesses are different. So don't, I mean, learn from Warren Buffett or whoever, but then basically go ahead and, um, you know, you know, come up with your own process. So, um, all right. So then the next uh, is how do you define and manage risk? 
you know, sorry, I missed one. How do you make buy and sell decisions? I think that's important. Like when you, once you value the investment, like what's your process? What are your thresholds? Like what do you need to do to buy something uh, or sell something? Very important. And then finally, uh, or next, I would say not finally, is how do you define managed risk? It's a broad topic, but some people think volatility is risk. Some people think that, um, in, uh, that you have, other factors like permanent capital loss, which is what I think of as risk. So yeah, how do you define it and how do you manage it? And finally, how do you construct your portfolio? How do you take the individual investments? Uh, how, and how do you then uh, make sure that, you know, you come up with a portfolio uh, out of it that meets your uh, criteria for managing risk? So those are the, uh, the elements. Let me see if there are any questions and uh, then I'll come back to um, the rest of the presentation. Um, okay, so we got one more. All right, so what is some, so let's, uh, from Sean, oh, oh, there's one more, I'm told. There. All right, one more. All right, so uh, bonds return 5%, of which 2% of inflation. To earn 1,000K a year locks up a lot of funds. Uh, right, so that's back to the point about the bond letter. I think that's right, it does lock up a lot of funds. Um, they'll, uh, and so your return, by the way, you know, the best, you know, if you want the highest expected return, then you should put all your eggs in one investment. That's your highest expected return investment, right? Why do we not do that? Why do we have more than one investment? Well, because we're not sure we're right and because we can be wrong. And so usually reducing your return is in some ways a, the, it's the premium, the insurance premium you have to pay for achieving other goals. In this case, not being able to save, uh, to be a forced seller. So you're right. Let's say you have a million dollars and you try, you know, or let's say you have $2 million and you try and take 5% out each year, having a five year bond letter would be $500,000. That would be a, a quarter of your investment. That's fair. And you're gonna have a lower rate of return on that. But the good news is then you can really optimize and maximize the long-term rate of return on the 75% versus what happens is if you have everything in your long-term investments and then in the, you know, a three, four a year downturn comes. We haven't had one recently, even 08, 09 was fairly quick. It was severe, but it was quick. But if you look in the 70s, you look in the 20s, it can happen. So you have to think about risk broadly and not just use recent history as this is all that can happen. You can have a period where for three years, stocks you know, get obliterated, you know, at least on a mark to market basis. What do you do? You're going to have to sell a good chunk of your portfolio to meet your expenses and lock in those losses. What's going to be cheaper? No, there's there's some trade-off there. That's why maybe three, and you can use a three-year bond letter as a compromise, so that it locks up a little bit less. Uh, all right, next question: What are some good ways to audit funds from the investor side? The difference in the slide deck versus fund managers' actions uh, got me thinking: How you would investigate to be sure funds are managed the way uh, the managers had previously communicated? I think that's an excellent, excellent question, Sean. So I think um, again, going back to, I read a lot of letters. And sometimes there's a one pager with a performance update. Well, that, that doesn't tell you much about how the performance was generated. So that's not good from my perspective. Then there is the person who talks about the world, the Fed, the, you know, who, who knows, gold, Bitcoin. That's great. You know, I call them deep thoughts. You know, the deep thoughts are great, but they, they still don't tell your potential investors or your current investors how you execute your process. So the way what you should demand is as much transparency as is possible into what what's in the portfolio and how why why is it there how is that consistent with the process if you're reading someone's letter or you're talking to an investor and they can't explain that in a way that makes sense to you pass because look there are a lot of people out there who can create a, a pretty slide deck that's easy um it, it people can talk a good game i mean look most of this industry doesn't have value we all know that so if People aren't being transparent with how the capital is being deployed and aren't explaining to you what they're doing. You know, and you don't have to explain every, you know, I'm not saying they should send you all their spreadsheets, but they should at least explain like how does what the portfolio looks like today, how does it relate to the process they outline? And by the way, that will eliminate the vast majority of managers. Most managers do not have a written process. And I can tell you from some of the firms I've been at, if you pick a stock at random from the portfolio and really force that portfolio manager to explain the process or why it's there, that would flush out a lot of uh, deviation. By the way, 
I always when I said institutional due diligence meetings, and you know, I was you know I was one of the senior people, but not the most senior people, person in the room. I kept waiting for these supposedly sophisticated institutional investors to say, "Well, I'm going to pick a stock at random, explain how it fits your process." They never did. Not a single time. They always let the manager pick the stock. So don't let the manager cherry pick one or two stocks as their examples, which everyone has. Force them to, you know, explain as much as possible to make sure it actually is being implemented. Um, all right. So, what are the investing areas that you think you uh, have an edge? What do you think about distressed debt, event-driven versus being a generalist type of investor? How do you source your investment ideas? So, I'm probably gonna put out a video. It's a future point on idea generation, but I also you know welcome. You know, I can, I'm happy to send anyone who sends me an email, and I'll provide contact information later on. My uh, my owner's manual, which covers that in depth. So rather than take up time on the call, I'll de if that's all right, I'll defer uh, to a future time. But in general, I think th there is one. You know, for, I'm not a specialist. By specialist, I don't. I mean, I don't have a narrow niche of 50 companies where I know everything about them, and I pick five or ten. There are some people who do that well. I think that there are upsides to that and downsides. The downside is that what I call, and I hopefully I'm not going to offend anyone too much, is the tallest midget problem, where you know you know these 50 companies, maybe none of them are good investments. That's quite possible, by the way. But because you know them and you have to invest within that domain, you pick something that's not that compelling in an absolute sense, but it's the best relative investment you can find. The upside, obviously, of specialization is domain expertise, and that can be important, and it's more important in some domains than others. Lost sound. Can you guys, uh, John is telling me that we lost sound over here. Can you guys, uh, can someone confirm for me if you can hear uh, what I'm saying? You're back. All right. Uh, I'm told I'm back. Whew. All right. Um, so, so basically, I think that you, for me, I have areas I know nothing about that I stay away from, and I have areas I know a lot about that I tend to hunt more in. So areas I know nothing about is macroeconomic driven areas, oil related stuff. I have no idea what the price of oil will be in 10 years. And by the way, contrary to what some investors think, if you can't have the, a reasonable range of values for that key input, the price of oil, how are you going to value an energy company? Like I would love to know because I've not found a way in my 18 years of practice. So there are areas I stay away from and then the areas I know well, and then there are areas that I know okay, but I, once I decide to fish within them, I might know them really well for a specific company. So my expertise, the way I think about it, is microeconomic analysis, and I look for situations that have predictable long-term economics where the key questions really are microeconomic driven. So I'm going to keep it going, but that's a good question, and I encourage you to send me an email. I'll be happy to send you the owner's manual with more details on that. All right, so behavioral checklists. Um, I think that you... You know, you need to study the common biases. Uh, that's a good start. Next, you need to know your own tendencies. Uh, what biases are you most susceptible to? And then knowing about them is not enough. You need to really learn how to counteract them. So I'll give you some examples in a minute, but you know, study, uh, study mistakes of other investors. You know, there's, for instance, a publication called Value Investor Insight, and they do an interview with uh, a couple of value managers per year. And they, I think they started in 2005. So you have hundreds of interviews at this point. So when I mentor people, one of the latter parts of the mentorship program is going back to these well-known, well-regarded investors with a good record, reading their investment thesis historically, and trying to decide without looking at the future outcome, what we think of the, in, uh, you know, kind of uh, the process, what mistakes might they be making, and then, and then seeing what the outcome is, kind of playing, kind of playing along and studying mistakes. Because I think it's easier to recognize mistakes in others you know, uh, than our own mistakes or our own weaknesses. So at least study other people's mistakes and then uh, create active debiasing de processes and use them. You know, so I'll talk about a few examples in a minute. So a couple of examples uh, of behavioral biases. So, uh, you know, anchoring, you know, so over-reliance on our initial conclusions. So what's a possible remedy? You might actively seek an opposing uh, point of view. So an example is I had an investment you know, a few months ago, went down, 50%. It was a big position. And turns out that there was a short seller that you know had a very strong short thesis. So through a mutual friend, I reached out and I had a call with a short seller to get that point of view. And by the way, that wasn't to persuade them that they were wrong. It was to learn from them, to understand what the thesis is so I can get you know someone's 
point of view that's strong and different from mine. So you definitely don't want to think you have all the answers. You want to seek out those who disagree with you and try to learn from them and then decide on your own whether that makes sense or not. Uh, so another uh, very common bias is base rate neglect. So basically, a lot of times people will do something where the base rates of success are fairly low. So maybe uh, you know that's something uh, like you know turnarounds, right? Um, you know, turnarounds, you know, have a low frequency of turning, but you know, someone might not might ignore that fact and say, well, forget the fact that only a third of turnarounds turn. Oh, this one is really good. Yeah, I got this one. Well, that's dangerous. You know, it's certainly you can be right that, the, that this one is going to turn, but make sure you understand why the base rate is not apl applicable in this uh, in this case. So study the, the base rates of similar situations. Another one is the endowment effect, and this, by the way, is not if you're managing you know, Harvard's endowment. This is, uh, although maybe that's applicable to everyone as well. Um, so basically, uh, you know, you you might want to have a situation where you look at what you own and decide: Are you biased because you like it more because you own it? And you, at some point, if it gets bad enough, you might consider actually selling it. So it's something that's you know just to get a, cl a clarity of view. I'm not suggesting you every time you have doubts you sell everything and then start from scratch. But there is an body of knowledge out there that says, look, you have you make better decisions about things you don't already own than the ones you already own. And another another common one is confirmation bias. You know, so you really want to address that by looking for disconfirming evidence. Uh, so a couple of examples of what I do in practice. So um, one thing that I do is I have what I call the thesis tracker. And what that is is for every company that I'm invested in, every quarter I categorize new information as does it, you know, is it consistent with my long-term thesis? Or if not, is it much uh, a little bit better, a little bit worse, a lot better, a lot worse? And I color code that. Uh, and what the force, and then, by the way, I don't, I don't use explanations, so it's not like, well, the company is not tracking to my long-term uh, assumptions, but there are all these reasons why. That's that's important. I'm not saying to disregard those, but in this step, I'm just saying, is it? How does it compare? And I use that uh, as a trigger to do, uh, you know, certain things. For instance, if I have several quarters in a row where the company is really not, uh, you know, tracking to my thesis, I re-underwrite it from scratch. Conversely, let's say I have a company where uh, I'm thinking of selling it because it's reached my value estimate or close to it, but it's had a number of uh, quarters where it's doing better than my expectations. That's also a an invitation to re-underwrite and reevaluate the business because business value might have changed for the better, and I don't want to automatically just sell based on a stale value that I have not updated. So that's one thing you can do is try to be as objective as possible. It's still not perfect, right? It's still you are categorizing that information, so if you're really biased, you can make an argument that you're going to mischaracterize things because you don't want to hear bad news about your investments. But at least it's better. It's a, it's a step in the right direction. And then another thing I've done is I've started what I call the Devil's Advocate Club with a small group of like-minded, experienced investors. Uh, and it's kind of like a, an alliance. You know, All of us have very small investment firms. And the way it works is a member can submit an investment that they want another member to present a strong opposing view on. And it's not meant to be like an armchair philosopher type thing where they go and they, you know, you know give you a quick 30 second opinion or they think about it for 30 minutes. Like people are supposed to do the work. The, the person requesting it hands over the data uh, and, you know, and then we have a discussion. Uh, and I think that's, you know, basically the cost of entry is, you know, in addition to being, you know, mutually selected by the group is that you have to be intellectually honest. Big boy and girl rules apply, so it's not about ego; it's about getting the right answer. And then it's about helping each of us make the best decisions. Um, so, I guess in conclusion, uh, and then I will have time for questions. You know, structure really does drive outcome. Uh, so, set yourself up for success. Be systematic and rigorous. Investing is hard. I mean, I think. Over the 18 years I've done it, I think it's harder now than I thought when I started. And it's not because I hopefully I got worse. Um, well, anything is possible, but I think it's because I just didn't realize how hard it was. I was naive and maybe overconfident and thought, oh, you know, you read the Warren Buffett stuff or you read Benjamin Graham stuff, and that's it. You run out in the world and 
you find great values and it's easy. It's not easy. It's hard. Um, and then the last point, two points is, you know, seek out like-minded people whom you respect for support, you know, uh, find people who, you know, are not ego driven, who are good uh, investors and who are willing to give you honest feedback and, and, you know, help each other out. And finally be humble. You know, I, I always keep learning. I read a lot. Um, I don't have all the answers. I know I don't have all the answers. That doesn't mean I'm not competent in what I do, but I think that if you assume you have all the answers, that is one of the biggest behavioral biases that there are. So be humble, keep learning. Um, I mentioned the, the owner's manual in the past. So basically, if you, uh, if you wanna learn more about how I do it, you know, this is the same owner's manual, it's 33 pages that I've sent to all my partners. It explains in depth the actual specific steps of the process that I use. Uh, send me an email, happy to share it. It's free. And, you know, there's it's not marketing for sure. It's the thing that I actually use, and it evolves, you know, over time, but slowly and by and large, you know, any decision I make really follows based on the process I described in there. And with that, you know, just leave time for questions. You know, this is you know, well, I'll show you the legalese, you know. As some of my friends uh, joke, this is a don't sue me page, you know, so please don't sue me. Um, and obviously, you know, do what makes sense for you. There's no one size fits all. Uh, I don't know your circumstances, but I think these are good structural principles for you to follow and to think about. All right, with that, let's see what, what we have as far as questions. All right, so how do you size your high conviction ideas in your portfolio? How has the cash portion changed over time in your portfolio? That's a good question. So I think uh, there's two two parts to it. One is how do you size ideas, and two is how do you manage cash. So let me uh, think. Go take them in a reverse order. So on the cash side, um, you basically can, um, you know, uh, you can be, uh, you can uh, take two approaches in general. One is you're going to be a relative value investor. And what that means is you're going to always be fully invested and you're going to pick the best of what's available. Uh, and it's that is what it, what it is. You know, if it's great, it's great. If it's not, it's not. And the, the logic for that, by the way, is that people usually say, well, you know, the markets do really well over time. And if you miss some of the best days in a few days, good days a year, you your return is substantially worse. So don't time the market. The alternative view is to have an absolute value orientation, which is what I do and what Seth Klarman does. And that's to say, I have an absolute threshold for, you know, for a rate of return I require from different investments. And below that, I'm not going to invest. And the reason is I'm not considering just today's opportunities, right? I'm also considering tomorrow's opportunities as well, because I believe that with a certain frequency, good uh, investment opportunities will uh, come again. So I think that's an important consideration. And basically, I take that approach and cash for me is really a bottom up residual. I when I started the fund, I, I had 85% cash. That wasn't because I was trying to time the market. It was because of the my I have very strict position sizing guidelines, which are in the owner's manual, and I stick to them. And if I can find enough ideas, then the residual is cash. I'm very happy to be fully invested, but only if it's in ideas that meet my criteria. Now, second part of your question is how do you size your high conviction ideas? Um, so the most I'll invest in one uh, investment is 15%. At, uh, at cost, and I will not, uh, not let it go to more than 25% at market. Now, let me zoom out and say, what, what am I trying to accomplish? I think it's always a good question to ask. What I'm trying to accomplish is to have no single decision, not just investment, but no single decision uh, be so important to the portfolio that if I'm wrong on that decision, if that judgment, you know, something I get wrong, that there's going to be such a large permanent capital loss that the rest of the portfolio can't overcome. So what does that mean in practice? Um, if I lose 10% in one decision, that's a lot of money. But if the rest of the portfolio does what I think it should do over time, then in one year's time or so, we should be able to get back to even. Uh, now, if I lose 25% or 20% on a single decision, that's you know, the rest of the portfolio will take years on an expected return basis to get back to par. So I think that you know you don't you want you want a repeatable process. And if you have a repeatable process, what you really want is you want many decisions over time uh, on the average to contribute to success. Uh, my style of investing is not to 
you know, swing for home runs and hope one stock becomes a 20 bagger. It's to make sure that I keep making on average very good decisions and that on average they generate a good return. Hopefully that answered that. All right, so uh, there's another question here. Um, Hi, Gary, do you think that the S&P index is a long-term Kelly bet? Uh, bet more of increasing market caps and bet less decreasing market caps. And as the edge, average gain, average loss is increasing, keep increasing bet size. Let me think about that. So I guess, you know, the way I think of the Kelly bet is that, you know, there are two inputs, you know, you, uh, you know I think he used this, you know, uh, you know at least uh, Thorpe's book is a good book to read on that. And he talks about the Kelly criterion and how to size your bets based on the size of your edge, right? And kind of the, the car counting, bringing down the house system of when do you bet a lot because the deck is stacked in your favor, literally. So I think, uh, do I think the S&P index is, you know, I'm not really, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. I'm going to think about this some more offline. But if you, by the way, if you run the numbers, the position sizes that we all should be using uh, based on the Kelly criteria are far, far bigger than what most people use in practice. Uh, like if you input the numbers, you'll see like you should be taking 30% positions for you or 40% positions for your best ideas. Some do, most of us don't. Um, and I read somewhere, it's not something I personally derive, so I can vouch for it, that if you basically do half Kelly, you'll get most, you know, a, a good majority of the return with uh, a lot less volatility. So I think S&P, what S&P is, it's essentially, it's a very rational, you know, it, it ends up being very rational because you it bets more and more on successful companies. So as Amazon proves that it's a be better and better business, its market cap rises, becomes a bigger weight. And as some business becomes obsolete and gets kicked out of the index, it, well, it's gone, right? So it, it sells the losers and bets more on the winners. So in that sense, maybe there is an aspect of the Kelly criterion uh, in there, but the sizing is very different. You know, uh, the si Kelly criteria sizes would be much, much more concentrated than S&P. So we have another question. What do you do to cultivate your investment skills and temperament? Uh, thanks for the presentation today. It's very helpful. Uh, thank you for the kind of words. I appreciate it. Um, I think temperament is hard. I honestly, this is going to be discouraging because we all, a lot of us have learned that you want to have a growth mindset. You don't want to have a static mindset that you can get better at something. But let's let's think about this rationally. Let's say I wanted to become a professional basketball player. I'm 6'3", um, but I'm terrible at basketball. You know, I used to get picked for teams just because I was tall. And as soon as someone uh, saw me play, I would never get invited again, right? So let's say I really trained with the best. I really work hard at it. I'm just not going to be in the NBA. Now, let's be honest, right? So I think you temperament is a little bit like that. You can, I think you can make it better. And I think so. One thing I think that helps is meditation. If you think about meditation, right? It's, uh, you know, mind, especially mindfulness meditation. You you're trying to focus on something. A, usually thoughts come in, and they try and they your mind wanders. And the very act, so you're not failing when that happens. The very act of bringing your mind back to say your breath or whatever you're meditating on. It's kind of a rep. It's like lifting weights for the mind. So I think that helps because just like when you see your stock go down, you want to bring your mind right back to the process. Uh, forget the stock for a second. Let's focus on the process. So I think meditation is the one thing I know. I think some people, I used to work for someone in my past life where every time stocks uh, their stocks went down, they wanted to sell them. You know, And this was a value portfolio manager, a very senior person. I'm sorry if you're wired that way. Just you're not going to be very successful. <laughs> you know, uh, you, you know, if your tendency is to sell automatically when things go down, that's certainly not the value approach. And not to say that you shouldn't sometimes sell after things go down. That's a different conversation. But if you just have get this fear instinct take over and you can't think rationally, some people are just wired that way. So I think a lot of temperament can be taught, but you can improve it versus your baseline. And what do you do to cultivate investment skills? Um, I think that I read a lot. I, I believe in both. You kind of want to both train what you are doing and cross train. So I do believe in like mental models and kind of Charlie Munger talks about that having a lattice work of me mental models. So I like biographies a lot. I like bi uh, business biographies. So kind of understanding, um, in, uh, you know, how you know businesses succeeded. I think another thing that's really important is studying failure because there's a lot of selection bias in the information that we get. And so a lot of times you hear a lot about successes, 
and people forget the failures. And there's actually a great book. Uh, I forget the name. Uh, I think it's a billion dollar mistakes or something like that. And I can follow up if someone anyone has a question. And there was two guys to, uh, who studied systematically failures. They took all the companies that went bankrupt. Uh, and they basically studied systematic reasons for why they failed. And they came up with a few patterns. So you definitely don't want to just learn your own mistakes. You obviously do want to learn from them, but you don't want to you know, limit your learning to that. So I think studying the mistakes of others, studying failure, like why did great investors fail? Like Bill Miller was a well-known investor. So well, no, my mother, so we, we're immigrants. My mom and I came to this country when I was 10 and her first dollars of savings, she invested in Bill Miller's fund well before he was you know, world renowned. And um, for 15 years, he beat the market. And what happened then? He kind of like really lost his track record. He bet it all on black, maybe it was the Kelly criteria, I don't know, but the, in this case, Black was Bear Stearns and you know Lehman and, and all these financials, and he blew up in a spectacular way. I'm not throwing shade on Bill or saying he's not a good investor, but I don't think that was a good decision. Not because of the outcome, by the way. It would have been a bad decision if it worked out. It was just he risked everything. It was just too arrogant. Like you can't know that much about a couple of highly levered businesses by the way we saw this more recently with a very well-known value firm i won't mention the name but they own value uh, valiant and they let valiant become a huge position right um and turned out to be you know not quite what they thought huge process mistake and i remember being asked this is when valiant was at its peak and people were giving me a hard time why don't you own valiant it's such a great business why don't you own it and everyone was using this firm as an example well, if they own it they've done the due diligence it's such a huge position for them so again study people's mistakes and then again read a lot read a lot about business read a lot about other things and you know and take this serious it's kind of like going to the mental gym every day all right i think we're going to take uh one more question and then since we're at the bottom of the hour I'm I'm gonna uh, wrap it up and you know again welcome you guys are welcome to email me happy to try to answer additional questions. Um, so, what do you think of Buffett's claim that the average investor would be better off by holding a fund that matches uh, the, the S and P index? Um, I think he's exactly right. You know, and I've written about this. I know some of you might have read some of my Quora answers and I answer people's questions there, but very briefly, um, most people just can't figure out who the good investors are. And that's the problem. First of all, we know that most uh, active investors are going to underperform. That's not the main challenge because you can say, well, um, you know, I'm going to pick the ones that are going to do better. Well, first of all, the base rates of that are terrible. Most people don't succeed. However, it's not even just the base rates. It's the fact that most people lack the fundamental knowledge to assess an investor. So there was an earlier question of how do you tell if someone is a good investor or someone, how do you tell if someone's following the process? You need to be able to assess an investor's process. Some of you can do that. That's great. Then you're qualified to uh, pick active managers. But most people out there cannot, right? And so the last thing you want to do is be, you know, fooling yourself and be reading some barons, you know, puff piece on some manager and buying their fund because of that. And by the way, giving up one percent a year over a 30, 40 year period is a huge, huge loss. And I wrote an article. Uh, for Forbes, uh, you can uh, you can uh, search for it, uh, how to choose an investment manager. And my point in there is, like, you might, you know, you want to really make sure you're paying for what you think you're paying. And many of you don't need anything. Many of you can go to a credible firm like Vanguard and get perfectly good results by sticking to a dollar cost averaging strategy. And if you are the kind of person who can't assess a manager, I think that that's a very valid and very reasonable approach. Incidentally, Warren Buffett isn't buying the S&P 500 index himself. How come? Well, because he's the in the, in the small minority where he uh, he can do better. And there's probably a small group of people who can, but many people have trouble identifying them in advance. And that really is what it comes down to. Is can you get confidence in advance that someone's process and someone's structure and all these and someone's temperament and a bunch of things together are likely to result in superior results? Um, you know, the, the kind of argument that Buffett himself has given is his famous, I think it's 1984 speech called the Super Investors of Gramsville and Doddsville, where he talks about how value investors have consistently done better 
and not because they've copied each other's portfolio, but because they share a common philosophy and a common approach to how to add value in the markets. And he gave a number of examples. So that's another, you know, so small not group of people can do it. Some of you can figure out who that is. Many people out there cannot. And so those people are definitely be better off, in my view, in a passive approach. So with that, I'm going to end this. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, again, if you want me to send the owner's manual, send me an email. I'm happy to help in any way I can. Thank you, guys.